More than a million women in the UK are suffering with an illness which is leaving some of them bedbound, unable to work and in a mental health crisis. But you probably won't have heard of it. Chronic urinary tract infections can be debilitating, but experts warn that the awareness, testing and treatment for them is simply not good enough. Welcome to the Eye Podcast. This week, we'll be speaking to Eye reporter Connie Dimsdale about the hidden women's health crisis sweeping the UK. Hi, Connie. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So, Connie, firstly, can you outline for listeners who might never have heard of this what a chronic UTI is? So, a chronic UTI is a urinary tract infection that has become chronic. So that means the infection has embedded into the bladder lining and it is ongoing. It usually starts with an acute infection that then can develop into something that's more chronic. And what kind of symptoms would you be experiencing? So the symptoms vary from person to person, but it's bladder pain, pelvic pain, frequency, so needing to go to the toilet a lot, and a burning sensation when you pee. And it can affect anyone, really, men, women, children. It's quite common in menopausal women and elderly people as well. But it is most common in women and particularly people who are going through the menopause. So a recurrent infection will come and go, whereas a chronic infection, it's always there. Symptoms can vary in severity and can be completely debilitating, meaning People are bed bound. They have to quit their jobs in some cases because of the pain and also anxiety. And how common is this? You mentioned it's sort of majority among women. How many are we talking here? So it's estimated to affect 1.7 million women in the UK, wow. and that's by the charity Cutic. So it's a massive problem. It affects so many people and so many women specifically. But the really sad thing is that a lot of these women don't necessarily realise that so many other people have. There's just a real lack of understanding around it, which means that a lot of the sufferers feel completely isolated and they don't have the vocabulary to explain to their doctors or even their loved ones and their friends what is wrong with them and they can be left thinking that it's just them. Well, let's talk more about why, because despite this affecting such a large number of women, as you say, it's not something we hear that much about. And you've spoken to women, Connie, who've even struggled to get understanding or help from their doctors. What's going on? Why is this so hidden? Yeah, so that's a massive issue that so many of these sufferers have experienced. In fact, everyone that I've spoken to has experienced. And that comes from the term chronic UCI is not a universally recognised term. Mm. And since I've been reporting on it, progress has been made. So a year ago, NHS Digital, their online website, recognised the term chronic UCI for the first time ever. On their webpage about urinary tract infections, they acknowledged that a urinary tract infection can become chronic. And that seems like a small thing, but actually it's massive. But the NICE guidelines, so that's the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, they make recommendations for the medical profession in the UK. And they still don't recognise that chronic UCI exists. But in the guidelines for children, at the very end, there's a a research question that does recognise there needs to be more research into chronic UTI and how that impacts children. It's a bit of progress. It's a step forward, but we're not there yet. If the NHS as a body is only just starting to recognise this, the guidelines for which medical professionals are working with don't acknowledge this, what impact does that then have on patient care? It has a massive impact because so often mainly women will go to their GP and their GP will have never heard of this condition. And so they will get a test for a UCI because they come presenting with UCI symptoms. Their test will be positive and they will get a three-day course of antibiotics. Potentially their symptoms will get a little bit better, but then before long the symptoms come back again. They come back to the GP and the same thing happens. They get another short course of antibiotics and this cycle just repeats and repeats and repeats. 
But then in some cases, when the infection has become embedded into the bladder lining, the tests that are used in the GPs don't necessarily pick up a chronic infection. Now, experts have said that 50% of infections actually aren't picked up by the urine tests that are currently used in GPs. So that's these dipstick tests. So that's a, a massive proportion of infections that could be getting missed. And that, in real terms, that translates to patients coming to their doctor and then just being sent away again, told that there's nothing wrong with them, even though there potentially is something very wrong with them that is affecting them on a daily basis. This must be having an enormous impact on their lives. I mean, it's horrific. People have to quit their jobs. Relationships break down because they don't feel comfortable with themselves or they can't have sex because it's uncomfortable. People lose friends because they can't make plans because they don't know if there's going to be a toilet near. It completely destroys people's lives in kind of every sense. People have been left feeling suicidal because they can't see a way out because at this point they don't even have a diagnosis. They don't know what's wrong with them. It is awful. It's horrific for people. You've spoken to dozens and dozens of women now in your amazing sort of investigations. One of those is Vicky and Vicky has shared her story for this podcast. So Vicky Matthews is a chronic UTI sufferer. She's had UTIs on and off throughout her life, but it became chronic. And this is what she told me. I'm Vicky Matthews. I'm 43. I've been suffering from UTI since I was about 21. And in around 2019, I was diagnosed with chronic UTI. In around 2017, I started with lower abdominal pain, burning and stinging in my urethra and with bladder spasms as well. So some very uncomfortable and painful symptoms. During 2018, these symptoms became quite unbearable. I was making frequent trips to my GP and I was treated quite often for UTI, often with short courses of antibiotics. I felt at the time I was treated fairly well, but after making so many trips and journeys to the GP that I started to feel like, where is this going to end? What is the actual solution? Because I wasn't given any tangible solution except for take these short course of antibiotics. It was quite soul destroying after quite some time of this same scenario happening over and over again. Of course, you put your trust in doctors to know and be educated in what they're talking about. But of course, they only follow guidelines. And I now know that there are not the nice guidelines in place to be able to recognise the term chronic UTI and what that is and to be able to treat it. I've been a stay-at-home mum for quite some time. I'll tell you now that if I'd had a job at that time, I couldn't hold it down. I, I would almost certainly be absent from work. I felt like I was letting my children down because I wasn't the person who I used to be. You get very short with people quite impatient because when you're dealing with that kind of pain on a daily basis, it's hard to have focus and real perspective. I was just a mental wreck, I think. I can't tell you how gratifying it was to have your own hell <laughs> acknowledged and validated by a professional who listens to you and seems to be knowledgeable in what you're talking about and could offer me tips who could offer me a straightforward path to treatment and recovery. It meant the absolute world to me. It still does. I do feel like I'm still mentally recovering from that trauma. I don't feel like I've fully dealt with it. But now I'm further down the road of recovery. I'm starting to get my life back. I'm on medication that is not causing me as many problems as antibiotics something called Hiprex, which has just been amazing for me. It does a very similar job to antibiotics, but it doesn't come with the kind of side effects. And that has really quite revolutionised my life and allowed me mentally to get out of that hole. And I feel like I can do what I need to be doing and without worrying about being in pain on a daily basis and make plans and, and do things because that was such a huge problem, making plans and actually committing to things on a daily basis. I, I just couldn't do that. 
And now I've learned there's no nice guidelines. And for me, that I just absolutely beggars belief that people can be left in such a situation. I think the government and the NHS need to sit up and they need to listen because this is an entirely preventable scenario for thousands upon thousands of women that are suffering on a daily basis in pain. We need better educated GPs. We need better nice guidance. And we need testing and treatment, which is fit for purpose and is not letting women down. And we need it now. Now, some of this sounds eerily familiar, doesn't it, Connie? We've seen before with women's health issues, women being turned away, maybe not being listened to, not getting the treatment that they need. How does this compare to other women's health issues? And is this part of a wider trend? I mean, we see it time and time again, don't we? We've seen it with endometriosis. We've seen it with the menopause and countless other women's health conditions that are even less well known. I mean, the menopause isn't even a health condition. It's something that happens to every woman. And yet there's so much taboo still around endometriosis, around the menopause that's only really started to come to light, I would say, in the past five, ten years. Mm. And that is what I really hope will happen with chronic UTI. I hope that awareness will continue to be spread and changes will be made. We're currently in Endometriosis Awareness Month, which is a massive deal. That's not to say that care, treatment, diagnosis for endometriosis is perfect. It's not. And women experience the same dismissal still. But I think awareness is so important in developing doctors understanding and developing teaching and just in sufferers being able to be open about their condition and feeling less alone. So once we've got to the point where women if they can get a diagnosis from their doctors they eventually have got a diagnosis what's the deal with treatment for a chronic UTI? So the current treatment the main treatment is long-term antibiotics and people can be on these antibiotics for up to a year in some cases sometimes longer and it is successful for the majority of cases these antibiotics do work obviously it requires a lot of monitoring but one of the largest problems in terms of access to care is there is only one NHS clinic currently in the country that chronic UTI sufferers can go to it's the Lux Clinic at the Whittington Hospital in London and the waiting list is currently six to nine months long. So a lot of people can't wait because of what they're experiencing. So a lot of people end up having to fork out a lot of money to go private and get that treatment that is in a lot of ways life-saving. And presumably also, if there's only one clinic in London, what about if you don't live in London? Yeah, absolutely. And I've spoken to women who've spent thousands of pounds traveling to London to go to their clinic and or traveling to other places because other clinics aren't necessarily in the places where they live. I spoke to someone who lived in rural Wales who was spending insane amounts of money largely on travel. And that also means that you're in an environment in a place that you don't know. It, it just takes that little bit extra out of your life to get this treatment that should be be available everywhere for everyone if needed. I've spoken to a lot of specialists who have dedicated their lives to treating this condition and to pushing research forward and one of those is Dr Raj. Now she works at the Whittington so the NHS clinic and I spoke to her about what the state that patients are in by the time that they get to her. My name is Raj Kasria. I'm a consultant urogynecologist at the Whittington Hospital. I run the Chronic UTI Clinic, which is a tertiary referral centre for chronic UTI at the Whittington. I'm also an academic at UCL and I run the Bladder Infection Immunity Group. There's no official definition of a chronic UTI. Essentially, patients with a chronic UTI suffer with symptoms all the time. You have symptoms every single day. Tests are largely a dipstick test or the urine can be sent off for urine culture. Unfortunately, we rely on these tests a great deal. There's been a lot of work in the last probably 10 years and it's been building up in the last few years, which has repeatedly shown that both dipsticks and urine cultures are actually not very good at picking up infection. And it's largely to do with the assumptions we make about those tests and what they're telling us, 
but also about how they're done. And so this is a big problem because if a urine culture or a dipstick test is negative, it doesn't actually mean that you don't have a UTI. And in fact, if a urine culture is positive, it doesn't mean that we have identified what is causing your symptoms because those tests were developed, especially the urine culture was developed 75 years ago. And at that time, we thought that the urine was sterile. So we only thought that you would find bacteria there if there, there was a problem. But we now know that actually everybody has bacteria in their urine. So if you grow something in the urine, it could just be bacteria that is commensal to you, that is always there, that is not causing you a problem. Or it could be bacteria that is causing you a problem, but there's no way of telling just by the presence of that bacteria. We recently published a paper looking at some of the immunological aspects of UTI diagnosis and looking through the literature, we realise that it can take up to 12 years for a patient to be diagnosed. The symptoms are very, very intrusive, forever invading everything that you do. So these patients find it difficult to concentrate on work, on family, on having a social life. Also dealing with not knowing what's going on, not having a satisfactory diagnosis. Many of them feel they are not listened to or that their symptoms and problems are not taken seriously or brushed aside. And this sort of constant symptoms and the sense that you're not being believed or listened to, it really, really erodes a patient's mental health. So the patients that we see, I, I would say, are traumatized. And I don't use that word lightly. So we get people better and we try to discharge them. And we say, look, you know, you're better. Let's, you know, you don't have to see us anymore. Hooray. They actually feel distressed at the thought that they won't be looked after by us or if, if the condition occurs again, because it's been so difficult for them to get care. I would say it's a, it's a real lived trauma. We're the only tertiary centre in the UK at the Whittington which deals with chronic urinary tract infection. We see our patients every three months at least. They have access to us by email. We monitor their bloods every three months. So we look at the liver function and the kidney function because antibiotics can actually disrupt your liver function. So we need to keep a close eye on that. We serve about 1,600 active patients. We're having about 70 consultations a week. We've got three consultants. We've got the equivalent of two fellows, nursing staff. So it's quite a big undertaking, but that's what's necessary to deliver this treatment. You can then see how difficult that is to replicate because it requires a lot of resource. Currently, the waiting list is quite long, unfortunately. It's between six to nine months. We, we're actually working quite hard to do extra clinics. We need to have an understanding of the limitations of diagnosis across the board. We have to accept and acknowledge that in the NHS. And only then can we move forward and work with these patients. And ideally, we would really like non-antibiotic treatments. We desperately need more research into this area and new polymers, new non-antibiotics. You know, there's a lot of interest now, for example, in the vaginal microbiome and how it contributes to recurrent UTI and how that changes at different stages in women's lives. So to improve our understanding is really important. But the first step in that is acknowledging that we don't have a lot of understanding, is acknowledging that the tests are not great and acknowledging that these patients have real problems, real symptoms. And what can we do to help clinicians to manage that? Reporting like this, which highlights voices and issues so often overlooked, is crucial. At the iPaper, we have been leading the way on exposing this daily reality for so many women. To support what we do, consider a subscription. We have an offer on for 50% off a digital subscription and our weekend newspaper. You can get 12 months for $59.99 or try three for nineteen ninety nine. Head over to inews.co.uk forward slash podcast to get this offer now. And it ends on Sunday 2nd of April, so make sure that you grab yourself a bargain before then. Mm-hmm. 
Connie, what needs to change? I mean, we've outlined so many problems here, right from awareness to testing to treatment. Where do we go from here? So I think the next step is a universal recognition of the fact that chronic UCI exists. And then from there, we need research and we need understanding. We need an acceptance that the urine tests that are currently used in GPs don't work. They're outdated. It shouldn't be the gold standard and yet it still is. And that's written into the NICE guidelines. But we have come such a long way and that is really a testament to the patients and there's these big patient groups on social media and they offer real support to people that feel completely alone and time and time again women that speak to me say that their life completely changed when they came across one of these groups because finally they had a community of people that have been going through exactly what they have gone through sometimes for decades without recognition and validation that it's not just them and so really how far we've come is a testament to the patients and also the doctors the specialists that are leading in the field and that are pushing something over the past decade or so has been quite difficult to push and when I've spoken to them recently they do say that things are changing and that the tide is turning and the medical community is being more receptive to chronic UTI in general, which is really positive to hear. So you think there's some hope on the horizon and you feel optimistic? I absolutely feel optimistic. I mean, since I've been reporting on it, which you know doesn't account for what the patients have done and what the specialists have done whatsoever, but in the past year, we've had the NHS recognise that chronic UTI exists We've had an update to the children's guidelines that also recognise that chronic UTI exists. There is hope there. I mean, the government have put out their women's health strategy and it doesn't mention chronic UTI, which was a disappointment and is a disappointment. But it shows that there is a willingness to listen. And in my recent communications with the government, the NHS actually used the term chronic UTI in their comment to me, which was a massive step forward. But interestingly, the health department still insists on using the term recurrent UTI, which is inaccurate in describing the condition. I actually remember the moment that you got that email and I've never seen someone so excited to see the words chronic UTI finally written down. Yeah, I mean, it is. I wouldn't have expected to be so excited by something like that, but it is exciting when you see something shift, even though it's minor, it, well, it seems minor, it's one word. But it, it feels major when it's something that we've been pushing for as a paper and being the voice piece of all these patients as well. Well, I also think that a large part of this has been driven by your tireless reporting. You have never stopped on this, even when it's not the kind of sexiest topic to talk about. You've really been doing amazing stuff on here. So, yeah, all credit to you for doing that. This topic has also massively been pushed by Hattie Collier, who's our deputy head of news. And we've worked together on a lot of these things over the past year and into the future because we're not going to stop here. It's really nice to be in a place at the eye where we can report on these topics, like these women's health topics that we can push onto the agenda. And it's absolutely down to the news desk. And I'm really appreciative of that. There is hope. And I think when I first started reporting on it, it was quite depressing listening to stories that often weren't full of hope of people who were in the midst of of their problems and doctors who were fed up of not being listened to. But it is great to see that changing. And it means that now when I speak to someone who is in a really bad flare in the midst of their condition, I can hand on heart say that I do think that there is hope for them for, for new treatments. And that's a really nice thing to be able to hopefully reassure people in that way. Thanks so much, Connie, for coming on and also for your tireless reporting on this. You're really leading the field and I expect there's many people who are really appreciative of the work that you're doing. Thanks so much for having me. You can keep up to date with all Connie's reporting on this issue at inews.co.uk as well as a range of other breaking news stories, in-depth features and political analysis. We would love to hear your feedback, so do drop us a line at podcasts at inews.co.uk. I'm Molly Blackall, 
You can follow me on Twitter at Molly Blackall and on Instagram at Molly.Blackall. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next week.